Beyond the Game, brought to you by Turkish Airlines. Hello and welcome to a special Olympic edition of Beyond the Game. I'm Samantha Johnson and here's what's coming up on the show. We have a legend of breakdancing to explain why his sport deserves a place at the Games. And where there are winners, there are losers. We'll also be talking to a pro why squash has been left out yet again. In the 21st century, sport has been forced to change. It's had to become more engaging and more watchable for younger audiences, and the Olympics are no exception. In a move to reel in the next generation of fans, the IOC is set to put breakdancing in the Games. Paris 2024 will most likely be the first time we'll see the street dance in the Olympics, with the final approval from the IOC to come next year. Breakdancing will also join surfing, climbing and skateboarding, all of which will debut at the Tokyo Games 18 months later. But this isn't something new. The IOC has tried to include new sports for some time now. Take trampolining, for example, in the Sydney Games back in 2000. Even BMX made its Olympic debut in Beijing. And although other sports like squash aren't too excited about breakdancing on the verge of making the cut, Robin Adams takes us through why the IOC are giving it their full support. I'm in my zone, no travel. It's not a done deal yet. But breakdancing is a shoe in for inclusion in the Olympics. And the mere mention of the sport featuring at the Games in five years' time has created quite a buzz. I think that breakdancing will really bring something completely new, which again makes it possible to reach a new target. It's a very urban and spectacular sport with a very creative dimension. And from the start, Paris 2024 is trying to bring a lot of creativity and to do things differently. If it's a younger audience Olympic bosses are targeting, then breakdancing certainly ticks that box. The sport's push for inclusion has also been boosted by its appearance at the recent Youth Olympic Games in Buenos Aires, an event IOC chief Thomas Bach describes as the best ever. These uh, Youth Olympic Games were more urban, they were more female and they were more inclusive than uh, any edition of uh, any Olympic Games uh, before, not only Youth Games. <laughs> Breakdancing has a rich history dating back nearly half a century. When the 1972 Games in Munich got in full swing, breakdancing had just broken onto the scene in the Bronx in the United States. Since then, its appeal has grown exponentially. And the sport has reached virtually every corner of the globe. Dancing as a pastime goes beyond studio floors and professionally sanctioned events. Even the world's political figures can't help putting their best foot forward at big occasions. And from a sports perspective, the pros are quick to remind everyone that breakdancing is a lot more than just spinning on one's head or doing the worm. What allows me today to be the ambassador for France here and to be an international relay of our discipline is that I am among the very first, if not the first, to have underlined the athletic and sporting aspect of breakdancing. I very quickly, and for many years, integrated physical preparation, mental preparation. This is what has allowed me today to be among the most successful in the world. There's discipline, there's a healthy lifestyle. In our minds, we are athletes. But we are athletes who create. Dans notre esprit, on est des athlètes. Right now, it's not clear who actually runs this sport. That the World Dance Sports Federation, headquartered in Lausanne, Switzerland, is believed to have played a key role in bringing breakdancing onto the Olympic stage. In terms of timelines, the IOC is expected to offer provisional approval to the new sport in June. A final decision will be made in December 2020. For now, though, dancers all across the world can dream of gold as they wait. So is it a sport or an art form, or maybe it's both? But one of the pioneers in the industry, DJ Renegade, joins me from London to talk about it all. Uh, first of all, is breakdancing even the right term? Am I getting it totally wrong here? 
<laughs> it's actually not. It's a, it's a term that the media came up with in the 80s. We prefer the term breaking. And uh, internally, we actually use breakdancing as a pejorative. OK, well, you, um, you've also yeah. said that uh, you're tired of breaking being in the background of like films and music videos and no one puts baby in the corner. I love that line, by the way. Look, how much of a victory uh, is it for you that breaking is finally getting recognition on the sporting stage? I mean, I think it's a, it's a great thing. We've been, I mean, the scene's been around for 40 years and it's about time we got respect and recognition for the hard work that's been put in by, by our dancers over the years. I think it's a, it's a great victory. Okay, well, some people might think, okay, is it really a sport? I mean, why, in your, opin in your opinion, should it get the, the, gr the, the green lights for the Olympics and then a sport like squash doesn't? I mean, what are your, your views on that? Um, well, I'm not anti any other sport. I'm only going to represent the pros about my particular discipline. And, uh, like, it's, it's not really up to us who gets into the Olympic Games. They've seen something special in what we do, and it's their decision whether they're going to go forward with, with it or not. I mean, I think it would be a great inclusion because of what we have to offer, but the, the decision's down to the IOC. OK, well, how does it fit into the Olympic ideals of uh, faster, higher, stronger? Um, I don't know if you've seen breaking, but I think <laughs> we tick all those. I mean, it's very, very athletic. Yes, it is an art form. Yes, it is a dance. But it's, it's also a hybrid between the two, between being a, a pure art form and a pure sport. And you, like any, anything, you can, you can represent it however you want. And breaking definitely fits in the Olympic ideal of pushing your limit and, and going further, like, easily. It gets all three ticks for me. OK, well, you've actually campaigned oh, for breaking to be involved in the Olympics. What was your what was your key argument? Well, the same as has been mentioned, like it's, it's a fresh new look at things. Like if you want to get the youth involved, you're going to have to bring sports that the youth are interested in, interested in watching and things that are popular in a certain demographic. You know, some of the other sports, I'm not sure where their demographic is. Like I don't know many people who even play those sports. But there's a lot of people around the, around the world that are interested in dance and dance sport. OK, and when it actually comes down to the games, I mean, how do you actually do the judging? I mean, how would the, the scoring work? It's, uh, it's a completely new paradigm, actually. We had to, to go right back to basics to design a system for judging. It's not based on standards. It's just based on comparison. So you see a, a presentation of one piece of art which is then compared against another piece of art, and then you use the criteria or values, as we call them. Well, can you see any flaws in that? I mean, will you be having categories? There are not strict categories, because it doesn't really make sense in an art form. That's why I'm saying the paradigm's changed. It's not like you get a four for doing this and a five for doing that. We've completely moved away from that kind of thinking. It's, it's a bit primitive. We've, we've moved forward into a more comparative-based way of judging, okay, I suppose which fits it's, with art. It's still um, early days, I suppose. But um, are there any concerns uh, from the breaking community that, you know what, if, if this gets involved in the Olympics, then it kind of loses its essence of breaking? I think that's, that's going to be the same in any um, sport or discipline, that people think that you're going to lose something. By, but, but, but for me, increasing platforms increases not decreases. There's nothing to stop people breaking for fun or whatever else. Like, this is just another platform for us to represent on. Probably the biggest in the world. OK, well, breaking does Actually. have a very rich, I suppose, hip-hop culture. I mean, can you see why your community might be thinking, you know what, this is going to be watered down for the masses? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that happens anyway, in, in, whether it's music videos or theatre or wherever we're represented, there's going to be some compromise. And it doesn't affect the core of the culture. OK, well, um, when it comes to the IOC and I suppose the hierarchy um, with the Olympic organisers, urban and youth uh, really seem to be the buzzwords. Look, are they going down the right track when it comes to including breakdancing, surfing, uh, skateboarding into the Olympics? 100%. I would say the same in the theatre as well. It's like the world's changing and you have to adapt or you'll, you'll become obsolete. So it's up to these... Uh, I, I want to say old <laughs> institution, 
but they, they need to they need to look at the world as it is today, you know, learn how to use social media, see what the youngsters are interested in, because the future belongs to them. It doesn't belong to us. So it's really going to be defined. The future is going to be defined by what they're interested in and how they operate in the world. OK, uh, DJ Renegade, thank you so much for talking to Beyond the Game. <laughs> Well, another sport that will make its debut in 2020 is surfing. Mary McCarthy sat down with the CEO of World Surfing League, Sophie Goldschmidt, and she says thanks to the Olympics, there's never been more, more exciting time to surf. Surfing will be an Olympic sport for the first time in 2020. What is that going to change for the sport itself? I think it's a fantastic opportunity for the sport to be on what is arguably the largest global sort of sporting platform. This is a first step, um, but hopefully it will become permanent. Um, at the moment, surfing's only been accepted into the Tokyo Olympics, although very positively last week, Paris 24 um, confirmed that they have included surfing on the shortlist. Paris is a great example where we have a city not on the coast. Would we be talking about a wave pool or maybe moving the event somewhere, um, you know, a few hours away to the coast? To be determined. I mean, the wave system, the beauty of it is that in theory you can build them anywhere. Um, so that definitely is, is an option. We worked hard um, to have a wave system used in Tokyo, um, but they'd already made a decision to host it at the Chiba Beach. Yeah, we're just really focused on doing whatever we can to really raise the athlete profiles and really embrace um, surfing in, in Japan, which has a very rich culture of surfing. Um, people may not know that you know Japan has fantastic waves. Um, there have been great Japanese surfers across the decades. The WSL has had events there over, over the years, so uh, it's great to be going back there with um, Olympic surfing for the first time. Of the 40 competitors who will be in Tokyo, I believe two spots are reserved for Japanese nationals since they're the hosts, and then a big number of the other spots will be coming from your group from the World Surf League. Tell me about that. Yeah, so sort of the first qualifying criteria is through our rankings. So about half of the men and women that will qualify for Tokyo will come off our world rankings. So actually this year is a really important year. Not only are they competing to win the world title, um, they're also competing for a qualifying spot. Um, and there are a maximum of two um, per country. So for some countries that have several athletes in the top 10, top 20, um, they're only vying for two, two spots. So so, uh, yeah, it's going to be, I think, extra competitive and, uh, yeah, just that much more on the line. Your background is in marketing. To what extent does surfing as an Olympic sport present a marketing opportunity or even a challenge, knowing that it's a sport that even some surfers say is more of an athletic hobby than a full-on sport? Yeah, I mean, I think um, surfing has fundamental competitive and non-competitive elements to it. The fact that the surfers are competing against each other, but also mother nature, which is almost as much of a force as anything. And I think there really is someone, something for everyone with surfing. If you're into competitive sport, we've got some of the best athletes on this planet. If you're into um, ocean conservation, that's something we take incredibly seriously. If you like to travel and be adventurous by going to amazing new locations, we definitely do that. Um, so I think from my standpoint, that's kind of the beauty of the sport. There really is something for everyone. Well, skateboarding will also debut in Tokyo next year. Tony Hawk is one of the sport's all-time greats, as famous for his computer games as his 1080s. Beyond the Games, Paul Scott sat down with him recently and asked him how he was able to take skateboarding to mainstream. The catalyst for that was video games. I think that people, our video game was, was hugely successful and that in a lot of ways was people's entry points into skateboarding or the world of skateboarding. And I wanted to represent it well and, and be authentic about it. And so I feel like we did. And I think that it inspired a generation of kids to, to pick up skating or to at least appreciate it. And, um, it, uh, and, and here we are, you know, almost 20 years later, and um, it's been an amazing ride, and I feel like skateboarding has come to a place where it's as accepted as most mainstream sports. Kids choose to do it as much as they choose to go play soccer or to go play baseball, and um, it's, uh, it's been really great to be, to be able to participate in that as well, to, be, to still be in it and, and to still be relevant um, has been amazing. With that computer game I did, was it your idea? Did someone come to you? How was it, how was it born? Uh, I was working with a, a, a software developer uh, shopping the idea around 
to different companies. Um, we didn't get very much traction, but it established my name in the video game industry as someone who wanted to participate in a video game at some point. And a couple of years later, I got a call from Activision and they said, we are going to work on a game with skateboarding and we would love your input. And I saw what they were working on and signed on that day. And um, what's the journey been like? I mean, what involvement did you have day in, day out in, in, in developing and involving that game? Oh, well, uh, in the early years, I was very involved because it, it was a whole... I had to teach the, I had to teach the, the developing company about skateboarding in, in every way, um, in terms of skaters, in terms of styles, nuances, tricks, locations, uh, objectives, and so I was very closely involved with them. I would get, uh, I would get test copies mailed to me every week, give input, and we would change it. It took about two and a half years for the first game to to really get developed properly, and then. Every year after that, we were working on improving it. And after a couple of years, I didn't have to teach them so much about skateboarding nuances because they all became skaters themselves. When you look at esports now, in particular, the FIFA game, for example, so much money's being plowed in that. That's a sport right. in itself now. Do yeah. you feel like a pioneer in that respect? Um, I, I don't know if I, I can't take credit for the success of esports because we didn't really get to do the online element so much um, because uh, our game series sort of ended as that became the biggest thing. So uh, I think that in terms of the acceptance of home consoles, for sure we had a hand in that with, with the popularity. Let's talk about real skateboarding with a physical skateboard. It's going to be in the Olympics. How pleased are you that it's making its debut in Tokyo? I think it's cool. I think it's long overdue. I think that uh, skateboarding probably should have been there before snowboarding. <laughs> it's been around longer. And, um, and I think that they were, uh, they were neglecting it in terms of, or, or they were in denial of the popularity of what skateboarding is because it truly is more popular than, than many of the summer disciplines, of the summer games disciplines. So that being said, it's exciting. It's an exciting time for skateboarding. I think it's going to expose sk skateboarding to an, a new international audience and in places where they never realized what was possible. And uh, so it's going to be great for the growth of it. And I think that um, to people who think that somehow this sanitizes skateboarding or that it can, it's somehow we're conforming into this competition mode. There have been skateboard competitions since I started. That's how I ever got recognized. So they're not reinventing that wheel. Why do you think it did take so long? You mentioned the word denial there. Was there politics at play or was it just that the IOC didn't really understand? I think a little bit of both. I think that uh, the skate industry itself um, needed to get organized in order to establish the right sort of NGOs, the right sort of um, competition series, and, and all of that is uh, very complicated, <laughs> a lot of paperwork. So I think it was a little bit of both. I think it probably could have happened a little bit sooner had the skate industry been more proactive. Tempted to come out of retirement for it? Uh, no, I'm good. I'm gonna. I'm, I'll be happy to be there, maybe on the mic. But um, it's not. It's not my discipline anyway. The the part. The disciplines for skateboarding will be street and uh, park, and I still like the vert ramps. And that's not what they're gonna be having there. I think that I have a feeling that that it will be successful with the audiences, and that maybe the next time summer games come around, they'll include vert. Um, I'll be 54 then, so we'll see. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe, yeah, sure. Okay, Tony, thank you so much. All right, thanks. On the other side, not everyone was happy with the list of the new events proposed for the Paris Games. Among the sports rejected were billiard sports, chess, karate, bowling and squash. The biggest frustration came from the world of squash. Uh, the sport had already been rejected for the London 2012, Rio 2016 and Tokyo 2020 Games. The World Squash Federation and the Professional Squash Association expressed their frustration at the decision and Britain's former world number one, Nick Matthews, says that the sport should take legal action over their mission from the Games. All right, let's head over to Chicago to speak to the former professional squash player, Joey Barrington. Joey, thanks for talking to Beyond the Game about this. Now, after three attempts, why do you think that squash is being overlooked? 
I mean, it's uh, it's a slightly extraordinary circumstance, this last one, because the goalposts keep getting changed. Uh, squash met all the criteria that was originally needed for 2024 in Paris. Uh, with the equal prize money, equality in sport, uh, the men's and women's world tour is, uh, com is one complete tour. So it's a very straightforward scenario in that respect. The women, well, I'm in Chicago at the moment for the world championships and the women uh, have the exactly the same prize money as the men. There's equal entries within the countries that are playing. 71 different nationalities are playing on the PSA World Tour professionally. So the criteria were met from an international participation for equality in, in, uh, in, in participation and prize money. Um, and also from a broadcast point of view, it's heavily broadcasted around the world now. So it was um, hugely disappointing the night before they were told that uh, when the decision was being made that it was going to become a uh, it was down to kind of more of an urban youth uh, type style sport, which um, if squash had known about that, it would have been a different presentation that would have been made, really. But that was all at the last minute. So, yeah, it was um, so is this very, why, very disappointing. So is this why illegal, uh, the legal approach is going to, well, I don't know, do you want to go down that route? Should the sport go down that route? I don't think so. I mean, to be quite honest with you, squash has grown hugely in the in the last decade. It's It's the biggest it's ever been. As I said earlier, participation-wise, the world tours, the prize money, the amount of females that are playing professionally, which is up there with the men now. Uh, we've got a wonderful junior program around the world. It was very well, well received in the Youth Olympics. In very well there in Argentina. Um, it's a young sport. It's, it appeals to so many of the youngsters. That's the whole point of it, really. But we're not going to go down that route, I don't think. I think Nick Matthew was uh, hugely frustrated. He's newly retired and he's been fighting, obviously, to get it included in the Olympics, like all of us. But like I say, we've, we've kind of got other, other, um, other kind of aspects that we want to work on with sport, uh, broadcasting being one of them, um, and keep kind of appealing to all the, all the youngsters around the world that are kind of taking it on in, in new countries and, and new areas geographically. I don't want to, I don't think the sport want to get caught up in the back and forth with with the Olympic Committee in that respect. I mean, it's been so many years now that we've applied sport, getting participation levels up, getting youngsters up and, and increasing the, the professional level for, for everyone, really. OK, well, you said that, you know, you do get youngsters, you know, taking part in the sport. When, but when you <laughs> compare it to a sport like breakdancing, I mean, can you see why the IOC have chosen a sport like breakdancing or skateboarding or rock climbing ahead of squash. It's kind of hard to, I don't know, kind of get excited by watching squash, no? I mean, well, I mean, I don't know how much squash you've kind of seen. I mean, I mean, to watch break dancing and, 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 and skateboarding, it's, I mean, I did a lot of uh, skateboarding as a kid. I loved skateboarding when I was a kid and it was a kind of a kind of lifestyle in a way. Um, very athletic, you know, to be able to do that. It's underestimated what you can do in, in, in break dancing. Obviously, they're like gymnasts within reason and, and also uh, skateboarding. But the, the, um, from a TV aspect now, we're really starting to get a huge amount of data about the physicality. And uh, we're in a world now where everyone's gone crazy about CrossFit and all these different uh, training sports. And, and squash is up there with the very, very top sports in terms of energy outlay and athleticism. We can put a court up anywhere around the world. It's a temporary facility. Currently in Chicago, we've got the glass court in uh, the iconic Union Station, the train station there, which is amazing. We can put it up wherever. I mean, if it was in Paris, we could we could have the court by the Eiffel Tower. So it's, it's, um, it's a very flexible sport in that respect. Uh, very dynamic, which is the way the world is going. Um, it, it ticks all the boxes. And uh, the aspect uh, from broadcasting in the past, it was quite hard to kind of really show all those different elements when filming squash. But now with the all glass courts, as you can see, and the HD and the different cameras, the super slow-mos, you can, you can really showcase the sport. And for anyone that's never played the sport, but now looking to watch it on TV, you can sit there and really, really enjoy all those different elements I've been talking about. So, um, and the rules, the rules are very straightforward now. There's there's a lot of simplicity that's come back into to the ruling. So people can be armchair sportsmen and, and start to really understand, you know, what's going on with the sport. All right, Joey, thank you so much for joining us on Beyond the Game. It's a pleasure always. Take care.
And that's it from me, Samantha Johnson, and the team here in Istanbul. Thank you very much for watching. And seeing as we started with break dance, or breaking as the pros call it, we'll end with it as well with these B-boys and B-girls in Beale, Switzerland. Bye. Beyond the Game, brought to you by Turkish Airlines.